Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Rob Savage. I uh, teach um, Irish history at Boston College, and um, I am going to be hosting this um, this session, um, which is about Kane and using Kane as a uh, tool for research and teaching courses on uh, the Troubles. Um, I'll introduce our uh, panelists in just a second, but I thought I'd say a couple of words about um, Kane itself. Um, Conflict Archive on the Internet is a project um, developed by the International Conflict Research Institute um, of Ulster University. The project, again, known to all of us as Kane, publishes a variety of critical online primary and secondary sources that addresses um, and, and really documents uh, the Northern Ireland conflict. Uh, the chronologies, articles, documents, bibliographies, and biographies address the contours of the Troubles over the past 30 years. Our round table uh, today has been designed to address the challenges that confront teachers and research interested in exploring the complexities of the Northern Ireland conflict. What we hope to do is to address the critical role that the Kane website has played for years um, in, in helping us um, teach courses about the Troubles. Um, what we all um, understand is that it's been a wonderful tool and something um, that we sincerely hope will continue to enable us to um, work with undergraduate as well as graduate students um, in teaching um, courses that explore the, um, the, the conflict in Northern Ireland. So I'll go ahead and introduce the uh, panelists that'll um, be on this, um, this uh, roundtable discussion. Um, Tim McMahon is somebody that everybody knows in uh, the American Conference for Irish Studies. Um, he um, is, of course, the past president of the ACIS. He's an associate professor of history at Marquette University um, and a social historian whose research looks at, the, at national identity, imperialism, and popular culture in modern Ireland and Britain. Um, uh, Professor McMahon recently um, again served as president of the ACIS before turning things over to Kate Costello Sullivan. At present, he is co-editing a collection of essays entitled Ireland's Imperial Culture, 1800 to 1950, and writing a monograph tentatively entitled um, Era um, Imperter, um, Ireland's Imperial Ambivalence, that will interrogate the efforts of Irish men and women um, to build and manage the British Empire, while others worked to undermine it. Um, our Second panelist is Professor Dominic Bryan, who is an anthropologist, not a historian. I'm an anthropologist at Queen's University, Belfast. Um, Dom's work focuses on power in public space. He is interested in how identity is expressed through rituals and symbols in the public sphere and how these activities bond social groups and also uh, create conflict. His particular specialism has been examining conflict and civic space in Northern Ireland with reference to parades, flags, and historical narratives. This research has led to a long-term engagement with public policy. And um, the third speaker um, is Rachel Young. Um, Rachel is a PhD student, a PhD candidate at Boston College, and um, I have the pleasure of uh, working with her. Um, Rachel studies 20th century Irish cultural history, and she's really interested in the intersection of identity, memory, and visual culture. Uh, building on her master's that she received at Trinity College in Dublin, her work examines um, the way in which objects are used in Irish uh, visual representation of conflict. She's um, just embarking now on her research for her dissertation, um, which is a comparative project. Um, that explores activism through public art, um, looking at um, public art in Belfast, Derry, Bristol, as well as the um, Brixton neighborhood of um, London. So I, I'm going to turn things over to Tim uh, McMahon in just a minute, but I'd like to say a couple of things about Kane and the way that I've been able to use it um, over the past uh, 25 years um, while teaching at Boston College. Um, one of the challenges that confronts, I think, all of us in, in teaching um, a survey of the troubles um, is finding, you know, good, um, solid secondary sources as well as primary sources. Um, I've been successful in finding um, books that can help provide 
a narrative, a chrono chronological narrative, um, an overview of the conflict. Um, but what Kane has enabled me to do is to um, teach undergraduates um, how primary sources can really enhance our understanding of the conflict. And if anybody takes a look at the Kane website, um, you'll see that the main sections are focused um, uh, in a very user-friendly manner, especially for teachers. Um, there's a section on background to the conflict, and that really provides context um, to students, to undergraduates, some of whom will have had no experience you know, studying Irish history. If in the classroom we can provide a narrative overview, um, they can delve into the background of the conflict um, and look at the chronologies there that explain on a year-by-year -year basis um, how the, um, the troubles have uh, evolved. Um, there's a section on key events, um, whether it's um, the introduction of internment, um, Bloody Sunday. Um, these, um, these, this part of the website um, really enables um, students uh, to delve into sources that are critical to understanding um, how these events uh, unfolded. Um, and the way in which Kane has engaged with um, the Public Records Office in Northern Ireland is, is really helpful. Um, students are able to go in and look at actual documents, um, correspondence, memos, um, cabinet papers um, that help us um, and help students um, sort of chart the way in which um, the government and the security services, as well as different political um, operatives um, understood what was taking place. Um, other uh, parts of the um, Kane website um, look at you know, key issues that would be debated, um, whether it's um, about uh, gerrymandering, um, um, uh, about um, uh, sort of uh, reform, um, devolution, all of these subjects are, are covered um, in these sections. Um, another um, really helpful um, section is, um, is just the sort of, uh, the, the, the section that looks at um, sort of visual images and the photography um, that uh, um, chronicles uh, the, the troubles. Um, again, all of these um, sources um, and the website itself, you know, it enables um, undergraduates um, to get a, a, a more comprehensive understanding of um, the conflict, to hear a variety of voices. And that's really critical. Um, the, the Kane website has been a, a real asset for me, and I know for many of my colleagues who are teaching on this side of the Atlantic, um, where it's always been a challenge to find good primary sources. Um, Kane has been a really important tool and um, offers real balance um, to us. But, you know, we'll sort of discuss um, where its strengths are, um, some of the uh, places where um, it, it it could be um, enhanced over the next um, hour or so. So what I think I'll do from here is turn things over to my colleague, um, Tim McMahon, um, who is going to talk about um, the way in which he's used Kane for specific assignments um, while teaching at Marquette University. So over to you, Tim. Thank you, Rob. Uh, good morning and afternoon, everybody. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, continuing the ACES uh, into day four, uh, and uh, also to be involved in this specific discussion about Kane. Uh, what I'd like to do is take a couple of minutes to talk about um, where I work and the kinds of challenges building really right off of what Rob was just saying, um, uh, and then highlight three specific assignments that I've used, uh, uh, that my students have benefited from Kane uh, in their use. Um, uh, as Rob said, I'm a historian uh, and uh, I'm based in what is considered to be a medium-sized American university. We have about 11,500 students, roughly 8,000 of them are undergraduates, about 3,500 are graduate or professional uh, students pursuing various fields. Uh, my department in history uh, has had roughly 100 to 115 majors uh, the last decade or so. Uh, that number is actually down from when I started at Marquette. Uh, I think across the United States, we, uh, uh, those of you in the humanities fields, you know that we saw a decrease in majors, uh, particularly after uh, 2008. Um, and, and Marquette certainly experienced that as well. But we still have 
at about 115 a year. Um, most of our students come from the upper Midwest of the United States. Wisconsin, Illinois, and Minnesota are our top three uh, uh, states uh, represented in the student body, but we have students from throughout the United States and students and faculty from some 60 countries as well. Um, my remit in the department is to teach courses in modern European history, most specifically the 19th and 20th centuries, as well as courses in Irish and British Empire history. And among these is a course uh, that I've taught uh, many times uh, now on the troubles in Northern Ireland. It aims primarily at third and fourth year students in an American context, juniors and seniors. Uh, these are students who have had basic history courses and are now at the stage where they're pursuing uh, self-directed research, building higher level critical skills, including presenting information in written and oral formats. Uh, and indeed, on a, a couple of occasions, uh, my troubles course has been used as the uh, department capstone in our major so that they were only seniors in the class uh, and they were essentially pursuing research uh, at the late end. So I adapted the course a little bit uh, in those circumstances. Um, what makes that task particularly challenging, and I think Rob alluded to this, is that many of our students, even those who are history majors, uh, uh, have taken courses across an array, US history, European history, uh, global history, but they've maybe never taken any course specifically on British or indeed Irish history. So in addition to imparting a basic knowledge of 20th century Irish uh, social and cultural history, uh, there's a good bit, especially early in the semester, where you're doing some basic uh, narrative history of the Anglo-Irish relationship before taking a much deeper dive into the final third of the 20th century uh, specific to uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, generally speaking, I have students uh, uh, reading from some assigned texts. Often I'll use something like McKittrick and McVeigh's Making Sense of the Troubles as sort of a, a, an overview. Uh, but, you know, subject specific things such as, you know, Pringle and Jacobson's, those are real bullets, aren't they? Uh, uh, Marianne Elliott's edited collection, The Long Road to Peace in Northern Ireland has been especially useful. But it's always that search for primary sources uh, that are uh, interesting and digestible uh, that, uh, but maybe is not aimed at, at experts, but helps to build expertise. Uh, that's really what's needed. Um, and that's where Kane has proved invaluable. So over the years, I've tried to design a series of assignments that engage these sources and ultimately help the student to demonstrate their ability to synthesize, analyze, and communicate what they have learned. Uh, and these can include fairly standard research uh, papers that offer, you know, maximum flexibility in terms of the student's ability to uh, to develop uh, the themes that they're looking at. But three assignments uh, that have engaged their interest most, I think, and that speak to the uh, the really sort of the best of what Marquette tries to do in terms of ethical uh, thinking, um, have uh, generally involved an element of role play. So the first is a class parliament, uh, and I've used this assignment, uh, I think, on three different occasions. And actually, the first uh, uh, time I tried it was as a doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin, uh, teaching a course uh, uh, on modern Ireland. Uh, and it was as the uh, Belfast Agreement uh, was under negotiation. But essentially, the idea was to be a parliament uh, in which I assigned individual students membership in a political faction in the pre-Belfast Agreement era. And they had to adopt the relevant platform and perspectives of their party on a, a series of issues. Uh, and then we came together with me sitting in the chair, uh, moderating the discussion. Uh, that continues to be something I think that they they have really enjoyed. Uh, and some of them get uh, fully into character, which is quite exciting. Uh, the second is another role play in which they again must adopt the position of various actors. And this point, it's, it's during the hunger strikes uh, of the early 1980s. Whether they represent H-block prisoners, their families, the Thatcher government, the unionist party, the Ulster Unionist Party, the Democratic Unionist Party, the Catholic Church, the government, 
of the Republic or indeed Irish America, they have to prepare to answer a, a series of questions. And I let them then debate these questions uh, in class. Uh, these range from what is your ultimate goal for uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland? What are you willing to do to achieve it? Do you consider members of the IRA to be freedom fighters with a political motive? Are they criminals? Are they something else? Be prepared to back up your position with reason. So they have to have gone through and actually developed a sense of who their, their group is so that they can have a legitimate discussion. A similar exercise, and the last one I wanna highlight for you, uh, is a class debate near the end of the term on whether or not there is ever justifiable violence. In this debate, I don't assign students a particular position. Instead, they have to consider violence and peacemaking from multiple angles. Thus, I pose a series of questions to them about uh, that they have to come prepared to talk. And these include, is there a difference between violence carried out by different actors? That is, is violence carried out by the IRA different from that carried out by loyalist paramilitaries? Is paramilitary violence different from that carried out by state actors, whether it's the RUC, B-Specials, the Gardi, the Army? Are certain types of violence more acceptable than others? Would changing circumstances such as who is in charge of the state or what the political dynamic is on the ground leads you to take a different attitude toward violence at one point in time or another? Are there re realistic alternatives to violence? And if so, how could individuals, organizations, and or states be engaged to encourage nonviolent transformation? And what roles can international actors play in shaping circumstances that either make violence or that help to diminish violence? And I would point out that that last question is one that took on particular relevance uh, you know, after 9-11, um, in part because when we started talking about international networks uh, supporting terrorism or supporting violence in general, most of my students came in with a very um, Middle Eastern centric view of what that meant. And you know, what I brought home to them was that uh, people who looked a lot more like me uh, had been financing international violence. Um, uh, specifically uh, in one corner of the island of Ireland. Materials on Kane have proved invaluable to help my students over the years with these assignments. And I'd like to close by just discussing what was certainly the most exciting end of semester exercise yet for this course. Having performed various of the assignments that I've just been talking about, the students had learned a considerable amount about the troubles by the end of the 2010 semester, uh, fall semester. The previous summer, the late Norman Houston, who led the Northern Ireland office in Washington, had visited Milwaukee's famous Irish Fest music festival. And we struck up a conversation about my course there. And Norman made an extraordinary offer. He asked whether my students would be interested in spending time with members of the Northern Executive. From that simple question, he helped me to arrange a video call featuring DUP MLA Robin Newton, who called in from Brussels, and Sinn Féin MLA Jerry Kelly, who was in Belfast at the time, uh, during our last week of the semester. And for 90 minutes, they fielded questions from students who had considered questions about violence, justice, and peacemaking in the class. And it was an absolutely unforgettable experience. And I, uh, it would not have been possible without the resources maintained on the Kane website and ultimately the cooperation of a very gifted diplomat. In many ways, it represented for me, the best of transatlantic cooperation between academic institutions, as well as between a seasoned diplomat performing outreach to a university uh, in the interest of mutual understanding. So I, I'm a great fan of the website and what it has meant for me over the years. And I really look forward to hearing from the rest of you today. Great, uh, thanks, Tim. And um, I'll turn things over now to uh, Dominic Bryan, who's uh, again, an anthropologist at Queens University. Um, over to you, Dom. Thank you, Robin, and, and um, it's a great pleasure to, to, to um, speak at the conference, but particularly speak about the Kane website. And I was giving it some thought uh, after Robert suggested that we might have this round table um, about when I first came across the Kane website, and it occurred to me that, do you know what, I think it was probably almost the first thing I ever did on the internet. I look at the dates, 
And I think when I started actually searching things on the internet, and I've got a feeling the Kane website would have been right there, right at the beginning. And it says a lot about Martin and the others that have run it over the years, how forward thinking they were to start collecting stuff and, and, and developing this website um, when they did. It reminds me a little bit, for those of you familiar with Belfast, the political collection of the Lynn Hall Library, which I'd probably say about 30, 35 years earlier, librarians there had done the same thing. And they just decided in their case to collect all the ephemera that was coming out as the politics um, was almost, you know, was, was expanding as the civil rights movement was taking on. And there was so much politically happening and they just collected everything, uh, which has made their political collection, Linhall's library, such a, a, a rich resource. And all of those years later on, um, our friends at University of Ulster did the same, did the same thing. Um, and therefore, and created a totally unique contribution. Now, for, for those of us who are teaching in, in, in Northern Ireland, it's different. You know, like Tim, um, uh, uh, many of our students come from Northern Ireland. Um, uh, you know, whereas, whereas he's bringing the students up to speed on things, most of the ones we have are, have their opinions. Um, uh, and, and, and there's things all around them. So there's plenty of them to see and do. There's plenty in the newspapers. That said, you really, you, you know, you really have to start looking through the Kane website and understanding how it's organized things, how it's, how it's, it's it developed key issues. It's, um, uh, it's conceptually thought about the problems. It's got uh, unique pieces of writing in there. There's a whole history of the academ academia that's, that's written on Northern Ireland exists in Kane. You know, you, you just have to look and see and see who wrote about it. And for some of us, it was actually our earliest writings appear on a, 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 a Kane. For me, it was probably a chance thing because, because when I, my research was on orange parades and people who know uh, their Northern Ireland will know 1990s. So the, the period when Kane started was the, also a period when, the, when parades were um, uh, a, a, a very, a very high level issue. Um, so its contribution has been outstanding. All right. And, and it, it, in some ways, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in just a few seconds, it, it's almost become a victim of that success um in some ways and I'll, I'll raise those issues because i like i like to hear people's thoughts and, and questions on those over the years it's added quite a lot i can think of projects that stand out to me um they had a whole series of stuff on on victims and memorials that was done with ahrc grants um from the i think the mid to late noughties um which you can see online and and in case you see, sometimes people forget wasn't what, 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 what was and wasn't there at the time. And, you know, after the signing the agreement in 1998, there was not lots of stuff looking at victims. It needed, it needed work. And uh, you can see the material pulled together on the Kane website in something that I think a very important, um, a very important section. The, the one I probably use the most on it, all right, and find most useful are the maps. All right, they've got a great section on on, on, on looking at the maps tell you so much. They tell you so much about this place. They tell you so much about this place over time. And, and, I, and, I, and I regularly go to the map section on the Kane website uh, and use it. Um, uh, Naproni's added, not being, a, um, not being a historian, I don't as often use that sort of material, but some of the additions coming from Prony are also uh, fascinating. On it now, there are limitations to all of this, which I'll, I'll I'll come to in a minute. But the the one thing there's lots of there's lots of discussions in Northern Ireland about should we have a museum space on the on the conflict, and in part, and I'm very keen on there being one. By the way, I think I think we need to try and and capture and create a space of I think learning and remembering. Um, but in part, you know, online the Kane website sort of done that. You know, there's so much there and it overcomes some of the deep problems of narrative um, because of its diversity. 
uh, right across the website because of the different sorts of languages that are used in different places, because of the different sorts of writers and the way things have worked. The diversity is sort of built into the website. So some of the problems that you'll have in trying to come up with a museum have been overcome um, potentially by accident, but simply by the, the breadth and the diversity of the way Kane has been um, has been developed. Now, um, and, and so I recommend all the students to go to it. I tell you, you know, you, you, I don't have to recommend a textbook. I don't think there really is a textbook on Northern Ireland that I feel overly comfortable with. Um, but it's a site with so many resources that it, on all of my teaching, it appears as the top resource that people need to go and use. So, so given all of that, where do some of the tensions arise? Because I think they're I think they're worth raising because some people might know that uh, Kane has struggled in the last few years to get sustainable funding. The University of Ulster has raised questions about its existence and what it's supposed to be and how it's uh, supposed to move on. And you know, a lot of us who use it all the time are somewhat surprised at the idea that it might not go on. Um, uh, or it might just be archived and sit there. Um, but the reality is that, that, that people at Kane and around it have had to think about how to, how to take it forward. And then there are issues. I mean, how do you define exactly what it does? I mean, is it almost, does it almost become effectively a website on Northern Ireland? You know, is that what it is done? Because, because when you're looking at conflict in Northern Ireland, you, you, you're under attention of saying, well, we're looking at we're looking at the way conflict works, or, or in effect, are we looking at society in Northern Ireland? How can we do one um, without the other? So, th so there's always an issue, I think, and how you uh, the, the boundaries of what you're collecting. And I and over the years, I suspect those people who've been looking after Kane have had multiple discussions about what you could put in and what you what you shouldn't put in. All right. Rather, I mean, you don't want these things to become sort of just huge collecting buckets where you can't find anything. So there has to be um, some thought. And you can see that uh, um, uh, as, a, as a tension. Um, uh, and, and there are dangers. There, there, whenever you go to a, a, um, a website or any archive, you've got to understand the archive. You've got to understand the history of it. So and there are dangers in the way things are things are collected and what gets put on it particular times, sometimes high profile issues go on or are taken up. And in doing so, you can miss things like, let me try and think, things that be, seem more prosaic, like socioeconomic change in Northern Ireland. And you can, you can concentrate on peace agreements or this event or that, and you can, you can end up with a very event-led linear discussion of things without looking at underlying economic change, because that doesn't immediately appear as being something that conflict is about. And yet social structural change might be the heart. So the, the real tension about what goes in uh, and what doesn't. So, um, so it's, it, you know, it does leave uh, sustaining um, a, a place like Kane over time with, with some issues. And I'm, I'm thinking through them. You know, one is the scope. With, you know, when you could, you could cap the conflict. You could say, look, the Northern Ireland conflict or the trouble stops at a particular period of time. That's what we collected. What that what, that's what the site's about. That that seems a bit unambitious, but you you know you could do that, and people would know what it was, and you could just collect around that period and not move forward. A bit like a sort of folk museum it ends up with a with 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 a whole lot of spaces which actually capture often a, a, a one decade, but but don't quite know what to do after that. So so the scope of it over time, because otherwise. You're just collecting broadly everything around the Northern Ireland conflict, which, of course, we still have conflict here. We're not a post-conflict society, as some like to say. We're a society who have managed our conflict in a different way, thankfully, uh, but we're not a post-conflict society. So how do you go on and how do you collect? And I think that's a very uh, difficult question. You've got to look at what people need. So you've got to look at what your state, to, to use those time on it or, or, or contemporary phrases, who your stakeholders are. Who is it? I mean, is it students? Is it students outside um, Northern Ireland? Is it an archive? What are the sort of people that want to, to, to use it? And that, and that creates issues. I think um, uh, having said all the wonderful things I've said about it, it's been very difficult for Kane to develop um, in its look because as, as technology has developed, 
Um, the, the K website now looks, I think, quite old. I sort of love it for that. <laughs> but I can see others, you know, feeling a bit of tension that it doesn't have some of the usability that, that some sort of more contemporary websites have and that stakeholders might uh, need that. Um, a lot of sites now would have greater participation in them. Uh, people are coming to it can participate in more interactive ways. Um, more blogs can go on, more things, the more discussion areas. I mean, should the site do more of that? You know, uh, can the site keep up with where things are going or does it have a job uh, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a sort of main archive in Northern Ireland? I frankly, I mean, this is a huge problem. The digital age is a huge problem for all archives. You know, everything I now do when I talk to government in various things is all on emails. It's all it's all digital. You know, so the collecting anything now becomes uh, becomes a massive problem and it needs it needs investment to try and uh, try and sustain it. Um, so, you know, I think I know there have been discussions over the years about where how Kane relates to other spaces. I think it's absolutely essential that we maintain it, but I do think we have to have uh, as many realistic conversations. It's, it has some funding at the moment, but as many realistic conversations as we can going to the future. Now, I'm going to say the last thing now, um, and this is an odd thing to say because we're talking about the World Wide Web, but I think one of the key things about, um, about the Kane website is it's based in Derry. And I think although, you know, it, it's covering things much further afield, I've, I've, I've always been, I've always recognised that. And in its own way, when you go through the website, it has a bit of a dairy feel to it, which I've always, which I've always rather loved and uh, appreciated. So there's a, there's a few real questions around the sustainer cane, which I think it might be worth us discussing afterwards. Anyhow, thanks, Rob, over to you. Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, indeed, we can come back to some of those questions. You raised some uh, great points there. So now on to uh, uh, Rachel Young, who I, I had mentioned before. Um, is a historian. She's a, a PhD candidate at Boston College. Um, over to you, uh, Rachel. Thanks, Rob, and thanks for inviting me. Um, Rob mentioned um, doing this roundtable on Kane, and I immediately jumped at the opportunity. Um, and without attempting to offend anyone else on the roundtable, I do think it is safe to say that I'm the only one here who spent their entire academic career using Kane, um, and I owe the website a great deal. It's had a huge impact on my personal journey on Irish studies. I was first introduced to the website when I was an undergrad, um, and like Tim had mentioned, I was one of those undergrads that came to university without any sort of background in Irish history. I was a first generation college student. I had no idea um, what I was doing, and I had no idea what I wanted to write my senior thesis on. Um, and I had a wonderful academic advisor who taught British history, um, but to say that he was at all interested in Irish history would be very generous. Um, we had our typical, you know, kind of two lectures per semester on Irish history. I think he assigned a, a writing assignment that we had to watch The Wind That Shakes the Barley and write some sort of opinion piece on that. Um, so when I kind of strutted into his office and said that I wanted to write a paper on Irish history, I don't think I was his favorite person, mainly because he had no idea uh, what to do with me. And, and his very generous time of sitting down and talking to me, he kind of figured out that I also enjoyed art history. And he said, I got a topic for you. And he pulled up the Kane website and clicked on it. And there appeared the political wall mural section. And that's it. I was sold. And almost, you know, 10 years later, I'm working on a dissertation about activist street art. So I can truly say that Kane pay, played a wildly critical part in my education. Um, the Kane website is the reason I finished my senior thesis. Um, you know, I used the mural directory. I used the ephemera database. Um, the website provided me with background information that I had absolutely no idea about. Um, that you know, Rob said about the timeline of key events that everyone uses to teach. This breakdown of key issues and. A, a reading list, right? This this really came became my first reading list, and the Kane website was essentially my entryway into all things troubles related. Um, and it, as an undergrad with almost, as I said, zero knowledge or understanding of anything Northern Irish, never taken an Irish history course before, it is the only thing that got me through. So clicking around this website was to me a lifeline. Um, I was sitting in North Philadelphia 
with absolutely no idea what I was doing except for this cane database. Um, and so it's importance in teaching, but also it's important to, as Tim said, kind of undergraduates who have no real resources other than that. And even when I had other resources, I still fell back on Kane. Um, so Rob had mentioned that I did my MPhil at Trinity. And even when I was in Dublin, surrounded by all of these resources that I didn't have as an undergrad, I continuously fell back on Kane. Kane was like my safety blanket. It was my security net. It's where I went in the deep hours of the morning um, when I didn't know what I was doing in Ireland. I didn't know how I got there or what I should be doing in academia. And I just clicked on links and links and links and links trying to build up um, my own personal education. And when I was in Dublin, I used the ephemera database to plan my first research trip to Belfast, which as a young 20-year-old female academic, my first solo trip to Belfast was a terrifying experience. And I used Kane to kind of map out where I needed to go and what I needed to see. And it also led me to my first trip to Derry. Um, so I was clicking around on the website and I happened to find uh, Peter Maloney's political ephemera collection and pictures of murals. And I emailed him through Kane. And essentially, he invited me to a research trip, right? He reached out, he, was, uh, he happened to be in Derry and he invited me up and I took my first steps in Derry on this research trip um, around, around the city with Peter Maloney, who I found through Kane, right? So even when I was surrounded by Irish studies resources in Dublin, I continuously fell back on Kane and the resources that that website could provide for me. And Again, as a PhD candidate in 2020, I registered for my last classes of graduate school, right? And I registered with the visiting Burns scholar who was Guy Biner at the time, and he taught two classes, one on Bloody Sunday and one on Irish commemoration. And at the start of each class, he provided the undergraduates with a list of helpful resources. And at the top of that list was Kane. And it was very mind-boggling but also so heartwarming for me to see that in a place like Boston College where the undergrads are surrounded by Irish studies resources, they have a program and faculty and so many resources at their fingertips that I did not have as an undergraduate, they were still using Kane. And mind you, while I was sitting in the classroom with them, some of them asked me for help as they had no idea how to navigate a pre-Twitter website design, which I found only mildly offensive um, that they turned to me as the oldest person in the room. And we're like, could you explain pre-Twitter internet to us? Um, and so they needed a little help navigating the website, but I sat in class and I watched these kids click on Kane and they brought up articles that they found on Kane in discussion and they they brought up primary sources in each class that we ever had. So they continued to use Kane in every single class, just like I had 10 years earlier, you know, with absolutely no resources. And it's they still used it in the exact same way. And as a person who's used it, like I said, through my entire academic career, I think that when we're engulfed so far as, you know, as presenting at an ACES roundtable in, in Irish studies, I think it's very easy to overlook something like Kane. Um, the website is obviously outdated. It needs upkeep, upkeep, you know, which costs money, which we all know. And as Dom said, there are some serious discussions that need to happen about the future of the website and what it should be doing and where we should be drawing the lines for Kane. But it's a hugely valuable resource for students, right? And it provides essentially students without resources to kind of enter this complex world of Irish studies. And I really feel that, you know, removing this portal is gonna be a disservice to young academics everywhere. Um, as I said, it literally came as responsible for my journey through Irish studies. So to, you know, kind of remove it or not update it or let it fade into the background, I think will really damage the future of Irish studies and the future for, you know, all young academics who are sitting in, you know, small community colleges or not in Ireland trying to pry out primary sources that they desperately want to see. So that's all that I've got for my own personal journey for Cam. I think I'm going to kick it over to Rob because I know that we want to get to some question and answer time. Great. Um, thanks very much, Rachel. Um, I, I just 
realized I lost uh, the ability to read questions coming in. So uh, maybe uh, somebody else can take a look at the questions coming in um, and uh, share that. But I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things that um, Tim, Dom, and, and Rachel have touched upon. And that's, again, how um, Kane has been used. You know, I um, was thinking when Tim was speaking about teaching um, courses on the troubles and the type of syllabus that I've developed for a troubles course over the past 20 odd years. Um, you know, it, it's always been a struggle to find a textbook. And I agree with Dom that there's really nothing out there that would really works um, quite well. I know um, Tim mentioned the uh, McKittrick and McVeigh volume is something that can be used, but it, you know, the way digital technology has evolved, we can now use different um, parts of books. We can use chapters, we can use a variety of different readings. Um, and uh, the, the Kane website ha has really helped enable me um, to open up um, a window um, into, say, a year, say, into 1981. I was just looking um, at the website just a minute ago and looking at the way in which Kane has worked with Peroni, um, with the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland. And the number of digitized um, resources, um, whether they're uh, letters or, or memos, um, documents from civil servants, um, politicians, uh, and others, it's, a, it's just a wonderful resource that, that um, enables a teacher um, to help um, a student understand how historical narrative um, is, uh, is written and, and, and how it's um, developed. Um, but I'd like to um, um, come back um, to a, a, a question um, that's been raised here, um, both by uh, Dominic and, and Rachel, and that is, um, you know, how Kane can move forward. I mean, I, it, there, there are things that are not there, right? That, um, you know, I, for instance, um, you know, I, I like to use uh, film, music, and, and literature to try and um, provide a, um, you know, a, a sort of a comprehensive overview um, and provide context to the, this, this uh, sort of, um, you know, the variety of uh, um, sources that can be used to, to teach courses in the troubles. I mean, what do you think is, is, is missing or what would you add um, if you could, if you were um, looking at Kane and saying, well, you know, in my course, and I'll start with Tim, you know, um, I wish I had this. I mean, Tim, what would you, what would you say that um, you'd like to um, see Kane add or uh, how do you think it, um, you know, a, a contribution could enhance um, the, the, both the website, but your, your teaching as well? That's a great question, Rob. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that I actually enjoyed uh, early on about Kane, and I'd love to see them add more, uh, is audio. You know, you talked about video, but um, uh, I'm I'm old school enough that uh, when I was when I was studying back in the day, uh, I was gonna I was going to do radio. Uh, and so, um, you know, like there's, there's a few clips on, on Kane of, uh, is it Rukeyser, the UPI, uh, reporter who was on scene at Bloody Sunday, uh, and their, their street interviews, and there's, there's literally you, the, the sound of the gunshots. Um, and my students have reacted, it, it's, it's visceral, you can see it, and it's, it's frankly, to me, the value of radio. Now, I realize there are other sites, uh, including archived BBC, uh, as you obviously well know, Rob, um, uh, uh, types of materials that one can uh, can turn to. But um, I think that that again, properly curated uh, in a site like Kane, uh, that kind of audio would be uh, quite affecting, and it could take us right up, uh, uh, not just to Good Friday. Uh, 98, but as as Dom said, it's it you know no society is really a post conflict society, and most especially Northern Ireland, uh, it's a through conflict society, uh, uh, and we're still we're still dealing with uh, uh, the implications of what went on, um, but that's that's the social historian in me who sees everything as a process, right? So, uh, uh, but sound sound would be it for me.
Rob, you're muted. No, I'm to you, sorry. <laughs> so, well, I, well I'm now, now I've turned my camera off. Um, no, I mean, I think, I think the issue here in the, di in the digital space that we're, we're at now is how you join things together. So, so there are some good archives out there and there's more TV coming on, there's more pictures coming on, there's more um, sound stuff coming on. And I don't think one site can be everything. What I think it can be is a hub. I think Kane has been good at that over the years of going to a space where you're gonna find things. And I would probably, I would probably look to Kane to be able to, and, and you know, I, I'm not even sure what's on it at the moment, but you know, knowing Martin and Brendan, some of this stuff I'm sure is linked right now. Um, it, um, as some sort of a hub that you can go to, uh, there are enormous problems with 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 how you capture all the digital stuff that's happening at the moment, with uh, all of the documents, all of the material, the massive stuff, you know, <laughs> the, the Twitter world that we live in. I mean, we now have tweets that sort of are becoming part of the historical record because they make a difference. You know, we, you, US has just had a whole presidency of tweets. Uh, living life on a tweet you know how the, the, presumably somebody's got been documenting them all saving them all and there's going to be um, um, uh, historians younger than Rob and Tim who are going to be that's that will be part of their resource um, so so I think I think the cane I think the cane site ha has a very difficult issue there my my plea would be I suppose is that is that can can we find resources to sustain it because it's got the basis of everything we we need i don't think it can do everything i suppose i'm also saying i'll just throw this one in as a thought i mean you know we have to you know we we get a cane free <laughs> there's lots of resources around the world libraries hold all of their resources around the world and most of the universities have to pay you know cane cane is the flipping original open access place to, in fairness to them now everybody's saying going to have open access i think that deserves uh, to be to be looked at and we've really got to find a way of, of of sustaining it as a hub with all of those other things that one would be able to go to is, is i think my thought thanks tom rachel yeah, I would, I agree with Dom. I would say as the, you know, as a Lorax of the millennials here, um, that the, that Kane really needs to interact more on social media platforms, right? So uh, again, when I first stumbled upon the website, it was literally just me click, you know, clicking through things. And, and Kane, I think has done a very good job of linking to um, prominent sites when it was first um, created, but I do think that it is it is lacking right now some social media engagement. Um, and again, you know, I'm sure we all know when you're, you're teaching students that I I reference things on on Twitter, on Instagram, you know, on social media all the time. Um, I always give my students an extra credit assignment to find me the funniest history meme, and that's and then explain to me why it's funny, right? And that's how they that's how I in, in try to engage them. So I really do think that that Kane is really lacking in kind of um, more engagement on social media and not even just engaging, but then also like Don said, kind of how to archive those things, right? I really feel like there should be some sort of list of, of prominent hashtags, right? Because that would be great for me as a person who's who's attempted to write an academic paper using Twitter, right? You gotta, you know, you try to track hashtags and how hashtags are used. So there is something to kind of this engagement of, of social media. And I really do think that if there's a way forward for Kane to engage teachers, to engage students and to grow kind of the database, it's, it's definitely through social media. So that as, you know, a true millennial, is really what I would like to see more of on the, on the website. Great, thanks very much, Rachel. You know, I was just looking through um, all the different comments, so I was finally able to open a window that had all the comments. Um, and, you know, overwhelmingly, um, the sort of feelings expressed here are about how vital um, Kane has been for uh, many members of ACIS who um, use it for teaching, um, but for their own research. Um, and, you know, that's something I also just want to touch upon is that, you know, Kane is a, a wonderful research, not just um, for teachers, um, working with students, but for researchers that are, you know, like myself, could have been around for a long time and are working on a project. It's it's nice to have, you know, Kane and have 
its chronology there, um, to have um, you know, an ability to look at um, different events and, and dive deeper um, and you know, get you know, leads um, about you know, where one can look. Um, but again, most of the questions, I mean, most of the comments coming in are supportive. And what I see in the comments section is mostly concern about the future of Kane. Um, uh, there's a, a number of people that have asked um, about um, how it's going to be sustained, um, how, you know, the things we're talking about, where we feel it could be enhanced, where it could do more. Well, you know, the questions are, are about, well, who's, who's going to do this? You know, what kind of plans have been put in place to ensure that um, Kane um, will survive, that it won't be uh, put on ice. I mean, Dom had mentioned this earlier in the discussion that at one point there was real concern that Kane was just going to be archived, that it was no longer um, going to be a, a sort of a, a living thing. But, you know, the comments I, I'm seeing here um, are about um, how it's an important resource, how it has been over a number of years, how many people have used it in their own research and their own teaching, um, but real concern about um, uh, its viability in the future and, and how, you know, the things that we'd like to see added to it, um, whether it's, um, you know, audiovisual um, sort of you know, sound and, and images, um, you know, how that's going to be done. And it, you know, comes to Dom's question about, you know, um, you know, cost, right? I mean, this, this is something that's been pursued by, um, uh, you know, a number of um, pioneering individuals over the years. Um, but at, at some point, um, there's going to be some very important decisions made um, uh, about its future. So I, I'd encourage people to write in with questions. We've got comments and they're all very positive and there, there's a great deal of concern there. Uh, but over to Tim, I see your hand. Well, so um, a, a couple of thoughts occur to me. For, there, is a, there is a question in the Q&A uh, also about uh, talking about how we introduce Kane to students. Um, and and uh, this is from uh, Amy uh, Heath Carpenter. And uh, she also uh, wonders if uh, there's a role for RAs or research assistants to be involved in helping to maintain and sustain uh, uh, Kane coming potentially from other universities. Um, you know, so let me just kind of to address both the funding and the, um, uh, and, and potentially the introduction. So one way I think that, um, uh, uh, you know, Ulster could, uh, uh, you know, do, engage in outreach is to be, uh, uh, to maybe network with faculty from around the world who are introducing the site to our students. Uh, I mean, I kind of think that during the um, uh, period two years ago when um, the review was underway about whether or not Kane should continue to get funding, um, I, I know they heard from people around the world. Um, uh, if, if those networks that were uh, started up at that moment uh, could be enhanced, uh, I think that um, uh, they might be able to find places they could reach out to to help raise money. Um, you know, American universities, I know that British universities and Irish universities are doing this as well, but American universities have this long history of setting up uh, endowments that provide regular income that is not subject to, uh, you know, government budgeting uh, on an annual or biannual basis. Uh, and it could be that, that that's what has to be the model that uh, is it used at least to partly fund uh, Kane in the future, that there be a, a, an established fund that keeps generating the monies. Um, uh, but also if there were some sort of crowdsourcing prospect where the institutions that are around the world and benefiting from Kane uh, have students who are helping to, uh, uh, you know, build its content, uh, uh, you know, that, that that might be a, a model that could be adapted as well. And in that way, uh, whether you're at an undergraduate only institution or you're at an institution that has undergraduates and graduate students, you are, you are in fact introducing them both to contents and limits of the, of the site and building on the expertise of digital natives uh, who are much more attuned to the way that uh, people are using the internet now, uh, younger people are using the internet now. Um, so, I mean, those are just some random thoughts. But. Dominic. Yeah, I, I was just thinking through this and, and, it, and, and, and it occurred to me that there's lots of things we look after in the world. You know, we have 
UN heritage sites and we have, uh, you know, the National Trust in the UK has got, I'm going to get myself in trouble here, but in my view, way too many lovely houses. Um, uh, <laughs> to, be, to be honest, you know, the obsession with the history that really, you know, is, is just yet another beautiful house that you can look around. They're very, they're very, they're very lovely. Um, uh, quite a lot of work with how they're interpreted, but anyhow, um, but, but we save all of those things. And um, there must be, and this is out of my field really, there must be thought about what, what in the digital world you also have to save and look after. All right, that, that is where we're at at the moment. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna sing the praises of the University of Ulster and then ask it a question. The University of Ulster was right at the front of, of, of exploring the conflict. You know, I'll get myself in trouble all the sack now, but but you know, I think in many ways we had academics doing at Queens, but UN set the but the but the United the, the uh, University of Ulster set down markers. It had the Centre of Study of Conflict, a little bit ironically in Coleraine um, before it's moved to Derry, but did 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 super things in the eighties and nineties thanks to thanks to John Darby, who then moved on to Incor, um, and then you and the, and, and, and and the, the UN. Uh, the UN invested in that, um, and, and ever since, I think the University of Ulster has, has set its store by doing uh, that stuff, all of its stuff dealing with the past, the, the, the Hume chair, you know, and, and I think the University of Ulster should be rightly proud of all of that work, and it should, and, and you know, it should recognise that the world sees that, I think, as a strength in what it has. So I suppose I'm making that plea um, partly because I sometimes worry that the, that, that, that the university might not recognize its own history in that sense. And, I, 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 you know, I'm not part of the politics inside the university, so I really don't know um, uh, who I'm appealing to. But I do think, I do think it, if you like, it's where the University of Ulster or Ulster University or the new University of Ulster or the Polytechnic, I was in various bits of it over the years, stands out. On a on a global scene, and I think for that reason, it would be terrible not to not to, to be sustaining something like uh, something like Kane. So I throw that in as a sort of bit of a history lesson in studying conflict in Northern Ireland, and just where um, just where the University of Ulster sits in that. Rachel. Yeah, I, I just wanted to to comment on on what Tim said about you know about teaching institutions and RAs being involved in this. I do think as we're talking about Kane as a teaching tool, I think it is vastly overlooked the ability to have students learn about history through how we choose to curate it. So I think that there is something in the idea of of having institutions um, and using undergraduate and graduate students and research assistants in this idea of building Kane and you know having them work on Kane as an archive because that is a, a I, in my opinion a wildly um, undersold kind of teaching method right to teach students how Don was saying earlier like well where do we draw the line what do we include to include students of history and anthropology and and political science in these kind of conversations while simultaneously helping to curate Kane and keep it alive is something that I think is is uh, something that we should seriously talk about because it's a great teaching tool and also sustains the archive in itself. So just throwing that out there. Yeah, no, thanks Rachel. And you know, I just want to reiterate something that Dom had said is that um, on, from this side of the Atlantic, um, the first exposure I know that I had and many of my colleagues have had to the University of Ulster was through Kane. I mean, Kane, you know, anybody interested in the conflict in Northern Ireland, uh, looking for resources way back when we were first starting to use the internet, um, it was Kane. It was the sort of only game in town. You could look at newspapers, sometimes you could try and deal with different archives, but Kane was really a pioneering force. Um, and that's something that I'm not sure, well, that, that, that I, I think that um, Kane should be quite proud of. In fact, uh, Martin um, uh, Mila has been in touch uh, to point out that the um, Department of Foreign Affairs um, in the Republic has provided uh, funding and that all the um, past funders for Kane are, are listed on the website. So there have been a number of organizations and institutions that have been vital in uh, seeing that Kane survives, including the University of Ulster, right? So you sort of keep that in mind, but it is a, a challenge um, going into the future. I see one of the questions that's come up is about um, using Kane. Um, for younger students, 
Um, there's a sort of a, a notion that Kane is something that works for undergraduates, for graduate students, and for um, researchers. But um, has anybody had any experience, or does anybody know um, whether or not Kane has been used um, to reach out to students that are, say, 15 years old or in, in what we would say in the States in, in high school or junior high school? Dominic, have you, Dom, do you know of anybody? In, I'm not, I mean, has, I'm not clear on that. I'm not, I'm not, um, it would be a whole nother round table. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I still remain very skeptical about the way that we in, introduce, uh, importantly introduce the nature of conflict here to our young people and to our kids. I know that having brought some of my own through this. Um, I'm not convinced by the history curriculum, to be honest with you. But for a number of reasons, which again is another, as a as another discussion, I'm not convinced by that 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 we. I mean, our our schools don't teach really political science. They don't teach sociology. They don't teach anthropology. They don't teach any of that stuff. I mean, it's amazing what's missing from curriculums. Um, I'll, I'll be really rude now and really upset people. Yeah, but they all know about the Normans. Right? They don't teach media studies at school. They don't teach me. I mean. <laughs> Our kids are obsessed by their phones and by all of this stuff and all the power that's involved. The schools don't go near that stuff. All right. So in some ways, I've got there's a much bigger picture. So I, do, I don't. The answer is I don't really know how it gets used, but I suspect it isn't. I would say, however, it you know, I don't think it's a naturally easy place to introduce students to would be my would be my gut feeling. The very complexity of, of the site in the sense of going into different things I mean that I mean because I'm not necessarily a great fan of starting with chronologies in some respects. Again, that's another discussion we can have. Wouldn't make it naturally easy. However, the need for a site that would work in a curriculum, and somebody will come on and tell me there is one, Dominic, and you know nothing, and that, that may well be true. The need for that sort of thing, I think, is very important. And, and I, my feeling is that still, that still lacks here. Great, Tim. So I, I you know, just to build on that, of course, in, in the United States, uh, I mean, we, we both you and I were saying earlier and Rachel uh, saying earlier that, that most uh, college students have very little sense of, of what happens. So secondary school curriculum here is not going to go into any great detail uh, on on the troubles in Northern Ireland, uh, I, I would qualify that by saying it may depend on the state and it may depend on the community within a state, right? Because uh, uh, you know our our uh, educational systems are local. They're uh, uh, unlike unlike a, a, a national system like one might have in uh, Ireland or in the United Kingdom. Uh, individual states uh, and uh, school districts and states determine their curricula. Uh, so you don't have really a nationally mandated curriculum here. Um, I did see in the chat that uh, Martin Mila was saying that um, there have been some educational publishers in the Republic that have reached out to Kane to see about incorporating some of the material, which I think is quite interesting. Um, how that gets incorporated into the curriculum becomes the next question, right? It's one thing to put it into the into the materials, it's how the how the faculty use them. Um, uh, that which which brings me circling back to uh, again part of Amy's question from earlier about how I as a as an instructor introduce Kane to my students, and one of the ways to do that uh, that I've done it in the past anyway is uh, the kind of thing that Rachel was referring to, where you you essentially uh, uh, ask them to to find something. Uh, it it, it it forces them to explore the site uh, and to come up with, uh, uh, you know, materials from the site that address specific questions. Uh, and, and then that opens up the discussion. Well, what did you find that you didn't expect to find? Um, what didn't you find? Um, and, and in that way, we familiarize uh, uh, the students a little bit with, with uh, both uh, what is there and the lacunae that, are, that, that remain. Uh, thanks, Tim. I, I see a question that's come in from my uh, colleague at Boston College, Christian Dupont, the uh, Burns librarian. Um, he asks a number of questions, including um, what does Kane do best? I mean, what 
in its presence, in its present form, does uh, it, it do best? What do we get out of it as, as teachers, as researchers? And then he also asks a second question about what can libraries do um, to, uh, to help, uh, to contribute to King? Um, should they be supplying material? Should they be subscribing? I mean, is that a kind of a, a financial, um, what, you know, perhaps part of the solution? Um, does anybody want to uh, go with that? I, I, I still go with the issues. So, I, I mean, I like going on to Kane. I mean, it, it provides a chronology which can be can be useful but for me you can go in there and look at a sort of complete issue um and i i find that an, a, a, a good way of doing that sort of sort of thing what's quite interesting is it also captures a moment so uh, it captures a particular period in time when that stuff was being was was being collected i i, I suppose it i mean the funding thing uh, you know the libraries and the archives, I mean, there's probably more, you know, the, the expertise in the Burns Library would be greater than mine in how you try and sustain this stuff. But, uh, I, and, and I really sympathize for libraries. I mean, at the moment, if you're managing a library where there are still those of us who, who think it should have shelves with books on, um, uh, it's, there are tough financial decisions to make. Yes, <laughs> I'm looking at you, yeah. <laughs> You know, shelves of books on, but we are, you know, we are in a, in a totally different world. And in a way, the Kane site was was um, so forward looking in all of that. Um, and, but like anything, it can, it, it can also end up getting getting left behind before you know it. You know, I haven't got anything to play any of my my tapes on. All of those mixed tapes I made in the 80s and 90s for <laughs> various you know girlfriends and things like that I can't even play them anymore they sit there unused I have to try and remake them on Spotify which is what I do on some of my sadder days um, but do you know how quickly that moves on so trying to think forward on how you do it and, and it is a real job for live that's not an answer but I, it's a real job for libraries and archives I think Prony in Northern Ireland I think the public records office and and it you know uh in the UK and the Republic of Ireland, dessert should should be engaged. Martin, I know they've had discussions, but they really should be engaged on this. Great, thanks, Tom. Uh, Rachel. Yeah, I I personally think that the what Kane does best are, are their databases, right? So I mean, I, for for me as a again as a person who had no other resources, the databases I think are really the thing that I think Kane shines through um, because, and I personally use visual material and ephemera in in all of my research and doing trying to do an undergraduate degree or write anything while you're on the other side of the Atlantic when you're focusing on images or ephemera, um, you know, in the, again ten years ago, now everything is much more digitized, even you know post pandemic post-pandemic. Um, but this idea that when I was writing my senior thesis that, you know, the political ephemera collections that were linked through Kane were really the only kind of sources that I had to see physical objects, right, to, of, of, of the troubles, right? The, the written primary sources I could find that, that was great, super helpful, but the databases that I'm looking at it right now, right, a guide to political ephemera, the mural collection, a directory of wall murals, political posters, handkerchiefs, symbols, which I know has Dom's work all over it, maps, right? So it's, it's these databases that I found incredibly useful uh, for jumping off points, right? Because the, I couldn't find those things in any other location. I couldn't find them in the library. I, you know, they'd be referenced somewhere, but I couldn't see them without physically going to to Northern Ireland. Um, so I personally think that that's really the uh, the ephemera and the visual collection of the databases is what Kane does really well. And to go back to Christian's question, I I think you know, and, and kind of what Dom said is that this is really who we need to turn to, right? So. Um, Christian has been very helpful. I also work at the Burns um, at, at BC and just being down in the archive and seeing how things are kept and learning from the librarians there is it's just a completely different world than being a historian or, or being you know an anthropologist. It's, it's just completely so far out of our field and I just think that kind of this idea that libraries could step in to kind of because they've gone through this of how to 
hold these physical things. So now how do we hold these physical things or these documents online, right? I think that they really need to be involved in that next set of debates and those next set of questions, um, just because I, I think that they really have the key to where we should be going with this. Great, thanks, Rachel. Uh, Tim. So one of the things that um, uh, I, I keep going back to, um, and I was I was reminded of this as as Dom was talking about uh, uh, chronologies and and that uh, you, you you don't want you know a particular narrative necessarily to come out of chronologies. One of the things I like to do uh, when I'm when I'm working both on my own stuff and when I'm talking to students is to tell them to come up with a different chronology, right? Because I think we all tend to, uh, especially as historian as a historian. I tend to go from political point A to political point B or uh, century mark, century mark, decade mark, et cetera. Um, well, let's let's throw that up in the air, right? I mean, if if uh, if I'm looking at changes in you know agricultural practice, right, and what that means for wider society, I'm not using the dates uh, that uh, are on most typical chronologies. Um, and so one of the ways that can I think can be helpful, uh, is actually to step away from the timelines that are there and start going into individual uh, uh, documents or uh, like Don mentioned, the maps earlier. Uh, why is something happening at a particular place at a particular time? Uh, what are the, what are the uh, factors that, that uh, led to that moment? Uh, because you're gonna get a different chronology uh, than, than a standard one, right? And I think that's really useful. But, but the other thing that, um, you know, just to, to talk about the limits of what a cane can do, right? So I, I benefit as a researcher, I benefit as a teacher uh, to exposing my students and myself to what is contained on this, on this site. But I also realize that as a, as a historian, as somebody who wants to know Northern Ireland and Ireland, I need to be there. Right. What's missing uh, when you read, especially a document uh, that has been digitized, uh, is like you're not smelling the tobacco that the person who was writing that document, uh, uh, you know, that's infused in the paper, right? That the paper's taken on until you're actually in the room with it. Um, you're not. Uh, you're not hearing the voices. I mean, this is where I go back to that notion of wanting more sound. Um, I want to hear the voices. Um, I want to. I want to smell the the air on the street because this is what actually people were experiencing in the moment. Um, and and so I want that to. I want Kane there as an important introduction for my students and for me as a researcher. But I want it to be the gateway that takes me to Derry, that takes me to to Belfast, that takes me to the border, right? And, and I think that's actually one of the ways that as Ulster thinks about how to sustain the site, they can talk about it as an investment in getting people to show up, right? Uh, Rob, I think you said earlier that, that uh, it was one of your first introductions to Derry, right? Um, uh, that was through this website. I think that is the case for a lot of people. And um, it's, it's an asset that actually is an investment in the future of not just the institution, but indeed of, of that entire region, so. Great, well, th thanks, Tim. Um, well, I think we've got about one minute to go. I just took a look at that clock and it's winding down. There are a lot of other questions just started coming in. Again, Kristen DuPont asking, you know, what do we want Kane to be? What would we like it to be in the future? Um, should it be a living archive? Should there be a, a keyword search that we can sort of delve into all different kinds of um, sources? I think the consensus that I hear from the panel and that I see in the comments is that it's a really important resource, uh, that it was a pioneering um, endeavor that we all hope is going to uh, thrive um, into the future. Um, so with that and with about 15 seconds to go, I want to thank um, our panelists, thanks to um, Rachel Young, um, thanks to uh, Dom Bryan um, over in Belfast and, and to, uh, to Tim um, up at uh, Marquette in Milwaukee. And um, thanks again to everybody at, um, at the ACIS. Um, we'll see you, uh, see you soon. Thanks folks.